Well, good morning. It's good to see everyone here today. And for our visitors, we give you a, a very special welcome. We're glad you're here, and we hope you'll stick around so we can get to know you a little bit better. Just so you know, however, I'm not the regular preacher here at Monta Vista. You just saw the regular preacher up here singing, or leading singing, so uh, it's kind of switching roles today. But our elders, for several years now, have set aside one morning lesson each month for, for different men of the congregation to have the opportunity to preach. And so today I have that opportunity. When Mitch asked me late last year if I'd be willing to fill this preaching slot, and then he went on, he saw me kind of hesitating, and he, he went on and he said, well, I'll put you late in the year. I, I, I said, okay, I'll do it. And then, of course, I started thinking, you know, oh, what am I going to talk about? What's going to be my topic for this lesson? Well, fortunately, something came to me fairly quickly. The title of my lesson this morning is Folk Sayings, Identifying Biblical Principles That They Teach. And some of you are probably sitting there thinking, how did he ever come up with that idea? Well, soon after Mitch asking me last year about this, Suzanne and I went to a quilt show out in Sun City, and this is something we like to do. We like to look and, and marvel at the quilts uh, and, and realize the many hours and hours of work that have gone into making those quilts. And it's always interesting because there's usually a story behind the making of the quilt. It may be something special about the material that was used, or it may be something about the design uh, of the quilt. So I had quilts on my mind, well, I needed to come up with a sermon topic. And all of a sudden, I remembered many, many years ago, Suzanne making a quilt for her sister. And it was a quilt that looked like this. This is just an example of what the quilt like. We didn't, unfortunately, take a picture of that quilt. But it's a wall-hanging quilt, and it has many, many pockets in the quilt. And... The special thing about this quilt for Suzanne's sister was that in each pocket of the quilt, there was a small card that included a saying on that card. When Suzanne and her brother and sister were growing up, their mom would often quote some phrase that seemed to her to be very appropriate at the time for whatever the situation, you know, like a teaching moment. So for her sister, the words on each of these cards brought back many memories. Here's an example of what one of the cards looked like. This one says, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. I remember hearing that a lot growing up. So when this quilt came back to my mind as I was thinking of, of a sermon topic for today, I thought many of these sayings really have an underlying biblical principle. And I thought it might be interesting to look into the origin of some of these phrases and see if we find God's word coming through in them. Well, I started formulating an outline in my mind, and I started doing some internet searches on the phrases that Suzanne had used in the quilt. But then, on July 9th, going home from services, Suzanne asked me, did you read Ryan's Family Talk blog article this morning? You need to read it, because you may have to rethink your sermon. So, so here's a screenshot of the Monta Vista website, showing the first few lines of that July 9th blog post. This was a really, really good two-part article, and if you haven't read it, I, I recommend you go back on, online and read it. The first part, in the first part, he wrote about a famous football coach making the statement, this too shall pass upon his being fired, and inaccurately went on to say that this was a phrase from the Bible. Well, later in part one of the, uh, of the article, Ryan talked about three other phrases that are often said to be in the Bible, but they are not. God helps those who help themselves. God works in mysterious ways, and cleanliness is next to godliness. Ryan also gave some causes as to why these mistakes are made and how we need to know the scriptures well enough that we don't make the same mistakes ourselves. In part two of the article, he listed five ideas that, can, that we can follow relating to this topic. 
And after reading these articles, I decided what I wanted to say could really complement his, his, the article that he had written. I'm using the term folk saying, but realize there are a number of other things that you can call these phrases. In my research, I found a state, this statement by a lady named Sheila Sichi, uh, who runs a, a website called brownielinks.com that's just full of all these phrases. And this is what she wrote about the subject. Common sayings seem to be the grassroots of our American culture. If your parents had nothing to say, they always seemed to resort to some previously spoken phrase their parents said to them. But to claim that these are really American sayings is false. Our nation is a melting pot of many cultures, so the sayings represent years of generations handing them down one to another, mostly orally, with their own cultural spin. Many were told to help educate and pass wisdom down from young to old. Their motive was to teach you a message of behavior or to give you philosophical wisdom. Some come from the Bible, although are not actually word for word. Well, why is that? It's because many people did not read or write, but their preacher came around and told them the Bible. So they remembered the Bible as they interpreted the message and passed it down that way. Proverbs and saints, they're usually short, either short and sweet, or they're, they're short and a little bit biting. Uh, they've been defined as the wisdom of many and the wit of one. And although proverbs, sayings, and maxims may be highly believed, they sometimes contradict each other. An example is about being too hasty. There's one phrase that says, he who hesitates is lost, and yet another advises, look before you leap. Well, the, those are contradictory. The first one says the, that to wisely not stop and wait before you venture forth, while the other one tells just the opposite and warns us to stop and wait before we start to venture out. So you have to decide which one will work for you. I want to closely look closely at three of the folk sayings that Suzanne used in her quilt uh, and, and put in the pockets of the quilt. But before doing that, however, and so you won't be wondering, well, what were the other 22? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go over 25. Uh, but so you'll know the other 22. I'm quickly going to go through those. First one I've already shown you, the grass is always greener. If you lie down with dogs, you'll rise up with fleas. You can't make a silk purse out of a pig's ear. A man, as a man speaks, so is he. A good reputation is more valuable than money. A low-class man will just talk. Deeds are the hallmark of a gentleman. Great oaks from little acorns come. Honesty is the best policy. God's rain falls on the just and the unjust. A guilty conscience needs no accuser. Don't cut off your nose to spite your face. Don't waste your worry. A stitch in time saves nine. A person is known by the company he keeps. Prevention is better than the cure. Look before you leap. Take care of the pennies and the dollars will take care of themselves. Don't slam the door. You weren't raised in a barn. Boy, did I hear that growing up. <laughs> There, there is always someone worse off than yourself. Every cloud has a silver lining. Slow and steady wins the race. Don't count your chickens before they hatch. Don't count your chickens before they hatch. That's a good folk saying to help, to help show the problem that Ryan talked about in his blog. It was really interesting as I started looking at this one. In 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 11, it says, And the king of Israel answered and said, Tell him, let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that putteth it off. The New American Standard Version reads fairly closely, Then the king of Israel replied, Tell him, let not him who girds on his armor boast like him who takes it off. 
the living Bible really changes this verse. The king of Israel retorted, don't count your chickens before they hatch. The living Bible, and this is what Ryan's lesson, why Ryan's article was so important. The living Bible is, is not really a version, it's a translation. Uh, it, uh, I'm sorry, it's, not, it, it's, a tra it's a popular paraphrase, I'm sorry. It's a popular paraphrase of the American Standard Version. And things like this can be the source of many people's misconceptions of what is and what is not in the Bible. So, let's move on to the three sayings that I want to talk more closely about, a little bit more closely. There are several different versions of this saying. Idle hands are the devil's workshop, and idle hands are the devil's tools. These are the two most common. And just like don't count your chickens before they hatch, this phrase is also in the Living Bible, the paraphrase, which is a very popular publication. Proverbs 16, verse 27 in the New American Standard says, A worthless man digs up evil while his words are like scorching fire. But yet the Living Bible reads, Idle hands are the devil's workshop. Idle lips are his mouthpiece. So what's the origin and the meaning? The origin of this saying is really unknown, but it's believed to be from very ancient times and is believed to have biblical roots. There was a Latin phrase that has been found with a similar meaning that is attributed to a man named Jerome, uh, who is best known for translating most of the Bible in Latin. He also wrote commentaries on, on the Gospels. The first English use of this saying is found in a very famous author, Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales. The meaning, the meaning of this phrase, of course, is it's a warning that not being busy doing good can lead, really lead us into trouble. Well, looking at what the Bible says about idleness, we find some very specific instructions. The Bible teaches us that those who are idle are easily led into sin. Let's look first at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 11. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 6 through 11. And where we find a warning against idleness. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Proverbs 19 verse 15 is where we find Solomon saying that an idle man will suffer hunger. So the main part, the main lesson from this saying really deals with idleness getting us into trouble. But I did, I'm not going to cover the second part of this slide, but I did find some information relating to idleness not being the same as rest. Idleness is when you really can get yourself in trouble if you don't have some good things planned uh, to do. The next phrase never heard my mom say this one to me. Pretty is as pretty does. Uh, I grew up with two younger brothers and, and I didn't have a sister until I was a, a sister who was adopted when I was a senior in high school. But mom never said this phrase. And I, I didn't ask Suzanne if her mom ever said to her brother, uh, handsome is as handsome does, which is the other, other form of this. Uh, and, and it turns out that Handsome is, as handsome does, is, is the more used or, or was more the original. Uh, the exact origin of the phrase also is unknown, but it's believed that the term was first used as handsome is, as handsome does. Uh, because just like the last phrase we covered, this one is also found in, in the Canterbury Tales uh, by Chaucer. 
1766, in the preface of, to a book titled The Vicar of Wakefield, the Irish writer Oliver Goldsmith wrote, handsome is that handsome does. And I found a number of places where the word that was substitute for, substituted for the word at. So pretty is as pretty does, or pretty is that pretty does. Uh, the first use of this in a US publication was in 1921 uh, in, the, in a pub publication titled The Journal of a Lady of Quality. Now the readily understandable meaning of this saying is that our actions say a lot more about us than how we look. As we move on to looking what the Bible says on this topic, I'm sure that some of you are already thinking in your mind the scripture that really applies uh, to this. Uh, remember Samuel being instructed to anoint a new king over Israel because of God rejecting Saul as the king. You'll remember that the new king was to be one of Jesse's sons. So in looking in 1 Samuel chapter 16, I'm going to start reading at verse 4 instead of uh, verse 7. 1 Samuel 16 Verse 4, Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of this city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on the appearance, on his appearance or on, his high, on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. In Matthew chapter 7, we find Jesus giving what is commonly known as part of the Sermon on the Mount, and in verses 15 through 20, there we find him giving a warning about false prophets, and he talks about people being known by their fruits or their works, and not by their outward appearance. So Suzanne's mom was teaching them a lesson when she'd say, pretty is as pretty does, that your, your actions say a whole lot more about you than how you look. Well, let's look at the final folk saying that I want to cover. See a penny and pick it up, and all the day you'll have good luck. Actually, this was the saying that my mom used as I was growing up. My mom didn't really believe that she would have good luck if she bent down to pick up a coin, and she certainly didn't think that bad luck would come her way if she left the coin laying on the ground. But picking up coins that were just left laying there on the ground and no one was around, they were fair game to my mom. She started doing this when she started doing a lot of walking years ago around the small town where we lived. Her plan was to save all the coins that she found and put them in a special account that she set up in the credit union. And that's what she did. She picked up coins and the money was never taken out of the account until she passed away several years ago. She always joked that this account was her legacy to her children to her sons and her daughter. But this is not the saying that Suzanne put in the pocket of the quilt to her sister. That's because their mom used one different word in that folk saying, in her folk saying. Suzanne and her sister grew up hearing their mom say, see a pin and pick it up and all the day you'll have good luck. Now, they both knew that the saying other people used referred to a penny rather than a pin but their mom was using pin. So they grew up thinking that because their mom did a lot of sewing and sometimes dropped pins, this was her way of encouraging them to help their mom keep the pins picked up off the floor so they didn't get stepped on with bare feet. So which folk saying is the oldest? See a penny or see a pin? Suzanne and I were both just really amazed because we just knew that Suzanne's mom was changing that word and she was the only person that ever that was changing that word. Well, we came to find out that see a pin and pick it up is how this originally started. It was a saying 
see a pen and pick it up, and all the day you'll have good luck. That was used in nursery rhymes. The exact date of this is, is unknown. But it is positively known that a version of the saying was known to be an old proverb as early as the 17th century. And then we know this because of a diary that was meticulously kept by a nan, man named Samuel Pepys, uh, who was in England. He was uh, administrator of the Navy of England, a member of parliament. But he's most famous for a diary that he kept. Uh, and he kept this diary, diary very, very meticulously for, for 10 years. His entry on January 2nd of 1667 included the following. This day at Whitehall, I overheard Sir W. Coventry propose to the king his ordering of some particular thing in the wardrobe, which was of no great value, but yet, as much as it was, it was a profit to the king and saving to his purse. The king answered to it with great indifferency, as a thing that it was no great matter whether it was done or not. Sir W. Coventry answered, I see that your majesty does not remember the old English proverb, he that will not stoop for a pen will never be worth a pound. Well, this shows that the idea, if not the precise current wording, is known to be an old proverb, was known to be an old proverb at that time. Many research, my research, as I went through this, found that pens were very expensive in the Middle Ages. They were made by hand, by monks, the, and, and husbands were even known back in the Middle Ages uh, for giving their wives what was called pin money because they were so expensive. Well, the meaning of the saying centers around the benefits of being thrifty, making sure the use of money and other resources uh, should be done carefully and not wastefully. So here is what the Bible teaches us about being thrifty. God provides for our needs. We need to use what we have been given wisely. Proverbs 21, verse 20 says, Precious treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling, but a foolish man devours it. Hebrews 13, 5 says, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In Proverbs 6, we read about the ant and how it prepares for its future needs ahead of time. And finally, we have the example of Jesus instructing the people to say his, his disciples to save the food after he'd fed multiple uh, large groups on, on two occasions. Uh, as we wrap up this lesson, there's one more point that I think we should consider from this saying. You remember how the Samuel Pepys in his diary mentioned about not bending over to pick up a pen, and that person's not worth a pound. Do you ever see a penny on the ground and you just walk by it? My mom wouldn't do that. She would see the penny on the ground as an opportunity. It was an opportunity to add to her legacy. She would see the penny and she would seize it. She'd see it, and she'd seize it. And in seizing the penny, she was teaching her children an important lesson. Don't just look at a good opportunity. Seize that good opportunity. And she taught us that as I was growing up in so many other ways. We always had a large garden. Usually it was about an acre in size. After worship services, she'd go up to people asking during the summer, do you need any vegetables? We always had plenty, and I can still hear her saying, when somebody might say, well, we'd like some tomatoes, still hear her saying, well, do you want a bag or do you want a bushel? <laughs> Mom, through her actions, was teaching us what the Bible says about opportunities. Galatians 6.10 says, so then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And of course, we have the great example of this in, in the story of the Good Samaritan. I think the Bible also teaches us about how we should respond when good opportunities come to us. Think about the parable of the, the talents 
found in Matthew chapter 25. Two of the three people who had a good opportunity seized that opportunity. The third person didn't even see the opportunity. Back to my mom. When she passed away, her legacy to her children was around $3,000. She had seized opportunity. She'd seized it penny by penny by penny and a few nickels and dimes and quarters in there too. But the greatest opportunity that she seized occurred in the early 1960s. In the mail one day, there was a hand-addressed envelope in our post office box. It did not have a return address on it. In the envelope was a pamphlet that was titled, What is the Church of Christ? Someone had sent my family an opportunity for something that was really good. Mom read that pamphlet. She read it over and over. She kept it with her. Several weeks later, we were going to the grocery store. It was summer, summer and my brothers and I were out of school, and so we were with her. Well, the Church of Christ was just down the street from the grocery, so we had to pass by the building. Mom saw another opportunity, and she seized it. There was a man getting the mail out of the mailbox out by the street. Mom pulled up to him, showed him the pamphlet, and asked if this is the same, is, if this is, is this the same Church of Christ that this pamphlet talks about? The man's name was Curtis Sampley. He was the preacher. And he said, yes, you want to talk? Mom went into the building and was baptized immediately. She seized the opportunity. If you are not a Christian, Jesus offers you the opportunity to become one today. Hopefully you see the opportunity and you're ready to seize it. We would be glad to help you with that right now. If you are already a Christian, but you've not been living in the way God instructs and need to seek the prayers of the church, you also have that opportunity right now. Will you come as we stand and sing?